Hungarian folk tales. The fairy from the oak tree. Once upon a time, many years ago, there lived the son of the Green King. Now, since he was all alone in the palace, he was bored, and so he picked up his gun and set off hunting. When he came into the forest, he spied a little rabbit, took aim, and was about to shoot. Hey, excuse me, young prince. One good deed deserves another. Spare me my life. And so he spared the rabbit's life and went further into the forest, while the rabbit scampered away. Then he came upon a fox, and the fox said to him, "Don't shoot, young prince. Spare me, and your good deed will deserve another." So the prince spared his life too and went further into the forest. There he found a deer, and the deer also spoke to him. Spare me my life, and good fortune will bless you. Off you go to the centre of the forest. There you will find an oak tree with three branches. Lop off one of the branches, and out will come a fairy. But take some water with you, for she will probably have need of that. So off he went, and he came upon the oak tree, and he lopped off a branch, and a beautiful fairy appeared. Water, water, please! I need water. The young prince dashed to help, but dropped his flask, and all the water spilled out. The poor fairy died there and then. All he could do was to take her in his arms and carry her home, and bury her. Time passed, and the prince set off hunting again, and he came upon the fox. Now then, kind young prince, for your good deed, I'll tell you something good. Go into the forest, cut off another branch of that oak, but bring water with you because you may have need of it. The prince had a flask of wine with him, and he thought that the wine would do. He lopped off the branch. Out came the beautiful fairy. He gave her some wine, but still she went and died. So he picked her up and carried her home in great sorrow, and buried her. After mourning her for a while, he once again set off into the forest to go hunting. And he came upon the little rabbit. Now then, kind young prince, for your good deed, I'll tell you something good. But come with me, and I'll show you a spring of running water. Then they came upon the oak. Now lop off that branch. And once again, a beautiful fairy came out of the branch and cried, "Water, water! I need water!" The little rabbit took the beaker, gave it to the fairy, who drank deep from it, and this time did not die. She then knelt before the young prince and thanked him for freeing her from the oak tree. They embraced and kissed. So now all three of them set off home. On their way to the palace, they came to a well and sat down beside it. There, the fairy spoke. I dare not go into your palace wearing fairy clothes. Please go home and fetch me some new robes. Now there was a willow there, and she climbed up into it, and a witch arrived to draw water. She glanced into the well and saw a beautiful fairy. She gazed and gazed, but couldn't see anyone in the water. Finally, she saw the fairy up in the tree. She called out to her and asked her what she was doing up in the tree. The fairy explained everything to the witch. And what did the witch do but seize hold of the fairy? And throw her into the well, and the fairy changed into a beautiful golden fish. Then the witch set off home and fetched her own daughter to the well and made her climb up into the tree. Soon the prince came back carrying clothes. He saw the little rabbit and asked him where the girl was. I went home to have a bite and a sup, and when I came back, she was up in the tree. So the prince looked around, and right enough, there was a girl in the tree. Down you come and put these clothes on. And when she came down from the tree, he saw her face, and it was ugly now. When before it had been so beautiful. Oh dear prince, I was struck by the rays of the sun, and they changed my face. So the young prince went ahead and gave her the clothes to change into, because he thought she was the fairy. And he took her back home to the palace. 
One day the witch came to see her daughter, and when she was there she said, I went by the well, and there I saw in the water a fine golden fish. Now what you have to do is pretend to be ill and tell the prince that the only thing that will cure you is if you have the golden fish caught. The prince would do anything for his princess. So the golden fish was caught and cooked, and she ate some and was cured. A single scale fell from the fish to the ground, and out of it there grew a beautiful golden apple tree, which burst into flower every evening and grew apples by noon the next day, which the fairies came for in the evening. Once again the witch went to see her daughter. What's going on here? You'll have to have that tree cut down or else they'll know that you're not the fairy. So the young queen said to the king, We have no use of that apple tree. Cut it down so that we won't ever see it again. Now nearby lived a poor man, and he was the one who cut the tree down. And when he was chopping it up into logs, a small chip flew off and he put it in his pocket and took it home with him. The following day, the man, his wife and daughter went off to work for the king. They set off so early that they had no time to sweep the floors or make their beds. But in the evening, when they got home, they found that the house had been swept clean and all the beds were made. And they wondered who could have come to their house. On the next morning, they set off to work again. But they left behind their daughter, who hid herself. What did she see but the fairy pop out of the chip of wood and start sweeping the house? Then the daughter took tight hold of the chip of wood to stop the fairy returning to it. So that was how they caught the fairy. And the two girls went off to work at the king's court. There they took turns in telling stories. The king asked, Now tell us another one about what you saw and did in your life. Once upon a time there was a young prince and one day he went hunting and he met a little rabbit, a fox and a deer. For I am the fairy who the young prince set free from the oak tree. And the prince embraced his fairy tenderly. He had the witch and her daughter tied to a horse's tail and the prince and the fairy from the oak tree lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales Tiny Tom and the Lily Princess Once upon a time, far, far away, over the ocean and beyond, there lived a king, and with the king lived a queen. And they had a very tiny son. No matter how many doctors they took him to, he just wouldn't grow. Tiny he was, and tiny he remained. The king grieved much over this, the queen even more. So much so, that she fell ill. On her deathbed she lay and called for the king. She said to him, All I ask of you is that when you bury me, have a lily planted on my grave, and have it guarded, day and night, so that no one can steal it. She spoke, and straight away, she died. The king was much in grief. If only my son were big, who can I leave my kingdom to when I am dead? He buried his queen in pomp, wept over her, and mourned her and he sent a proclamation across the kingdom calling for everyone who had a lily to bring it to the court so that one could be chosen for the queen's grave 
They brought lilies by the cartload, but they couldn't agree which one was the finest of all. The king could hear all this uproar and went down into the courtyard. What's all this quarrelling about? One of the gardeners replied, There are so many lilies here that we can hardly move, but we can't decide which one is the finest of all. Where are you, Tiny Tom, my son? Come here and do something useful for a change. Close your eyes and pick a lily. So Tiny Tom closed his eyes and groped around like a blind man. And do you know what? The lily he picked was beautiful and every bloom on it sparkled like a diamond. The king asked, who brought us this lily? Your Majesty, I brought it from Fairy Helen's garden. Well then, you plant it and keep guard over it so that no one can steal it. If you please, Your Majesty, may I ask that you send Tiny Tom with me? So if I should doze off, he'll be awake and alert. Very well then, said the King. And so it happened. The old woman planted the flower and guarded it as if it were her life itself. So there they were, keeping guard and keeping guard until the old woman said, Tiny Tom, I'm going to lie down for a while and I'll drop off to sleep. You stay guard over the lily so that no one can take it. No one can take it. You sleep well, old lady. And while Tiny Tom was keeping guard, out of nowhere appeared a little man. Good evening, Tom. Do you know what kind of flower you're guarding here? Well, I know that it's a lily and it comes from Fairy Helen's garden. You see, that lily is the princess from Dwarfland. Let me tell you. Helen once went to see the king in Dwarfland and took a great liking to the princess. So she begged the king to let her have his daughter for a week or two, and he did. Helen was envious of her beauty and she treated the princess so badly that she wept and wept and then she died. When she was buried, that lily grew out of her grave and it spoke once. Take me to the grave where a mother cried as much as I did over her dwarf of a son. And when the old nurse heard this, she pulled up the lily and brought it here. But Fairy Helen's own nurse heard all of this and told Fairy Helen. Now Helen can never be at peace until the flower is stolen back from here. Come here and I'll see to your troubles. And at that, the little dwarf of a man pulled his beard from between his legs and he disappeared as if he had never been there. Tom was thinking and thinking and tried to stay awake. Suddenly, he heard a fluttering and rustling. Twelve fairies appeared. They made a circle around Tom, dancing, thinking that they could make him dizzy and one of them could steal the lily from the grave. But Tom was sharp. He shook the old woman awake and said, Get up, old lady. They've come for the lily. So the old woman jumped up and took out her old spindle and then, swish, swish, she went at them. Be off with you from here, she said, and she beat and slapped the fairies until they flew off back to fairyland without the lily. There they told Fairy Helen that they had failed to bring the lily with them. Now she had a seven-legged horse and she mounted it and off she went. Now, as Tiny Tom was keeping guard, he suddenly heard a voice. Tom, I think they're going to take me away. Fairy Helen is coming. And out of the lily, there came a tiny young woman, more beautiful and radiant than the golden sun itself. Tom, Tom, if only I had my butterfly carriage for us to fly away in. And at the very moment she said that, six butterflies came flying there, drawing a fine carriage. The dwarf princess asked, Will you come with me, Tom? Of course I will. Never will I part from you. Up they went, up and up, into the bright blue sky. The princess turned and said, Tom, look back and tell me what you see. Oh, it's Fairy Helen. 
don't let her catch up with us. Up and up they flew as fast as fast could be. Suddenly, a huge sheet of flame came licking at Tom's back. Tom, look back and tell me what you see now. Oh, it's Fairy Helen. Her horse's breath is aflame and I can feel its heat. Just let us get up between the sun and the stars and the moon, for up there she has no powers. Now when they reached Dwarfland, the joy was great indeed. So pleased was the king to see his long-lost daughter that he swept her into his arms and covered her in kisses. He did the same with Tom. He said straight away that he would give his daughter's hand to Tom and make him king of the land. Then came the great wedding feast. There was no end to the dwarfs there. Each one more handsome than the next. And everybody lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales The Water Fairy Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, there lived a miller, and the miller had a wife. They had a fine big mill, and they earned their keep and passed their days. There was just one thing that caused them grief, and that was they had no child. And they grew poorer and poorer every day until they had nothing at all. The poor man lamented night and day that a curse had been laid upon them. Off he went one evening and sat by the mill pond. There he wept. All at once he heard a voice. Listen, poor man, I'll help you in your troubles. I'll make you richer by far than ever before. All you have to do is give me the living creature that you have not got at home. So the poor man thought to himself, what is it that I haven't got at home? Perhaps a dog? Perhaps a cat? What could it be? Right you are, I agree. The poor man cheered up and set off for home. He was still on his way when his servant came running towards him. Quickly, Master Miller, the mistress has just given birth to a fine, healthy boy. Well now, the miller ran all the way back to the mill pond. Come here, come here, you evil spirit. You have taken my child. But no one appeared. Home he went and told what had happened. They threw their arms around each other and wept and wept. What was going to become of their child? When would that voice take him away? raise the boy as the light of their lives. They never ever let him near the mill pond. And when he grew older, they told him that he was not to go there because the water fairy would carry him away. And the boy never went there. He avoided the place altogether. Now they became wealthier than anyone in the village before or since. Where they laid down a florin, the next day there were two. Time and tide went by and they sent their son to a master woodman so that he would be a forester. So taken was the master with the lad, so quick and clever he was, that the master gave him his own daughter in marriage. The young man went all through the forest hunting. One day he saw a fine stag. He aimed at the stag, but the stag vanished clean out of sight. Off he went again on the following day, and once again the stag was enticing the young man. And so it went on for three or four days. His wife spoke to him. Where is it you go every day, neither eating or drinking, only concerned for your forest? But don't go near the mill pond, just so that no trouble will befall you. 
I never go that way, my dear. I only go hunting in the forest. Once again, he set off, tracked the stag and brought him down. He thought of skinning it, but in skinning it, he got covered in blood, so he decided to go to the river and wash himself. There he set down his cap and his satchel. But once he put his two hands into the water, two mighty arms rose out of the water, fastened themselves around his neck and dragged him in and under. His good wife was waiting for him at home. She ran to the forest to the mill pond and there she saw his cap and his satchel. Dear God in heaven, what my father-in-law warned about has happened. Up and down the edge of the water she raced. Give me back my good husband, water fairy. But the water was silent. She ran and ran until tiredness overcame her and she lay down and fell asleep. In her dream she saw, not far away, a shack in which there lived an old woman who knew many, many secrets. She awoke and just as in her dream, off she went to the shack. She knocked at the door and spoke of her problem in floods of tears. There, there, my dear, said the old woman. When the moon is full, off you go to the place and sit at the edge of the waters. I'll give you a brush and with it you must brush your hair. So the young wife waited until the moon became full. She went to the edge of the waters, let loose her hair and began to brush it. And then, all of a sudden, her husband stuck his head out of the water, but he said not a word. And then he vanished again to the watery depths. She went home and told the old woman what had happened. The old woman said, tomorrow evening you must bring a spinning wheel with you and there you must spin. And so she did. She brought a spinning wheel, sat there at the spot and began to spin. And when she spun, once again the water frothed and her husband appeared up to his waist. But again they were not able to exchange a word between themselves. Off you go, dear girl. This is the third night. On this flute you should play a sweet, sad tune. Then you'll see what happens. And so it was. The young wife sat there on the same spot and played. At first the water started to froth and in she jumped and embraced her husband. But then such a storm blew up that her husband was carried off to one shore and the wife to the other. They were thrown so far apart that she stayed on one and he stayed on the other. Then the man took work as a swine herd and the woman as a cook. The swine herd brought the pigs out to feed every day and the woman brought food at midday to her master in the meadows. When she brought the food to the master, she saw that there was a swine herd off in the distance. So she walked towards him and they began to speak. And as they spoke, the young woman asked the man where he had come from. And the man began to tell her of how he had been born and how the water fairy had carried him away and how he'd been parted from his darling wife. And as he told all these things to his own wife, her eyes opened once again and she saw that he was her husband. Then they embraced and kissed each other sweetly and went home. They had many, many children and they all lived happily ever after. This is the end of my tale. Hungarian folk tales. Wooden Peter. Once there lived a farmer and his wife. 
Now these good people didn't have any children, and so one day the farmer said to his wife, I'm going off into the forest to carve as a child out of wood. Now his wife laughed at this, but the farmer bundled up his stuff and set off into the forest. There he met some wood carvers. God blessings on you this day. I came to get a small piece of wood. So they chopped him a piece of wood and he started to carve himself a child. It was evening when he returned home and his wife laughed when she saw he'd brought home a wooden child. They had their supper and there was a little left over. Now that's just enough for our son. Off they went to bed and around midnight the boy called out. Well, mother dear, are you sound asleep? At that moment they woke up and great was their surprise to see the wooden boy had come to life. They admired the boy until the break of day and then the priest baptised him and named him Wooden Peter. When he came to be three days old, he asked if he could go out and find himself a friend to play with. Hey, do you know if there's someone who makes swords in this town? Of course there is. So the boy went back into the house. Father, please could you give me eight florins? You can have whatever you need. All I need is eight florins. And off he went to the sword maker. Good day to you, good sword maker. Let me have for eight florins the sword that you first made. That's the one for me. So the sword maker went to the swords and sorted until he found an old rusty sword and a sheath to go with it. Peter took the sword, strapped it on, and it looked like the sword had been made especially for him. Now, here's your eight florins, for even your first sword has to be paid for. Next day there was a huge mob of people in the town. As they were moving towards the fair, they heard that there were two oxen tethered together with a golden chain. Whoever could cut the chain in two could take the oxen as his own. So Wooden Peter stepped up to say, if you'll permit me, I'll cut the chain. So then Peter set to and he cut that golden chain with a swish and a swoosh that could be heard across the country far and near. Up went the tails of the two oxen and they didn't stop trotting until they reached the stable. The owner of the oxen said, Well, Wooden Peter, off with you home to feed the oxen, but you should know that all they eat is glowing embers. Peter set fire to twelve bundles of wood. When they were aflame, he took the water pail and filled it with glowing embers. The two oxen ate them all up and one of them went off to where the sun rises, one to where the sun sets. So Peter said, Now, Father, let me show you something. He tapped the corner of the gate with his fingers in two places and from one of them, good wine gushed out and from the other, good brandy. Now, Father, everyone can drink to their heart's content. Do you see that wheelbarrow? I do indeed, son. And that millstone? Yes, I see it. Now, when the barrow stands in front of the door and the millstone jumps into it of its own accord, the wine will turn to water and the brandy to deep red blood. And then you'll know that I am dead. And then, if you want to find me, sit into that wheelbarrow and I'll take you to where I am. Now, I have to go off to see the world and try my fortune. After that, Wooden Peter set off across seven lands and seven seas until he came to a town in which there lived a king. Good day to you, your good majesty. Welcome you are. And what sort of journey are you on? I set off to be of service, to try my fortune. And how much would you require for a year? Nothing at all, only what I eat and what I drink. So Peter stayed in the town, working as a carpenter. He was so clever with his hands that the old king took a liking to him. Now the king had a daughter who fell so in love with Wooden Peter that she thought she would die if she wasn't allowed to marry him. 
Well then, said the king, I won't have you dying on me, so I'll let you give him your hand and be his wife. I'll announce a great wedding feast and you'll live as husband and wife. One day the king received a letter telling him to gather together everyone in the land to go off to fight in the war. When the king saw this, he began to weep. Now, good father majesty, do not weep, for I'll go alone to the war. My son, what can you do alone? You'll be like a gnat against a bison. But Wooden Peter went off and he was wielding his sword so fiercely that he beat them one and all. But then he stumbled, and that's how they defeated him. As quickly as they could, they buried him in the ground. In the morning, as the light was dawning, the barrow went to the door. The millstone jumped into it of its own accord, the wine turned to water, and the brandy to deep red blood. So the farmer got into the barrow, but went to where Peter had been cut down. He searched for him high and low, but to no avail. Then he saw the two oxen coming. The two oxen began to turn the soil with their horns until they uncovered Peter, but there was no sign of life in him. And so one ox put him back together again, and the other put his soul back into him. And wooden Peter awoke. Hmm, I slept so well. You'd have slept forever if it hadn't been for us, said the oxen. They went home and the king called the whole court together and crowned Wooden Peter king. And he and his queen lived happily ever after. Childhood. Now when I was born and all of six weeks old, out I went into the street on a hot summer's day, and I met a true old friend of mine, who was a bottle ahead of me and tipsy with it. So we made a pair of oxen out of mud, a cart and sacks to load onto the cart to take them off to the mill and grind them. And off we went. Now in those days there was a water mill to do the milling, but it wasn't there. The miller was strolling up and down on the water and so we asked him to call up the mill and he waved for it and shouted until up it came and we could start to mill away. Now the miller man didn't have a scoop so he pulled off my head and used that as a scoop. So when we were finished and off I went on my way home, who did I meet but a shower of women and young ones who started to laugh at me. What are you laughing at, says I. Ah, you don't have a head, says they. And that's how I knew I'd left my head behind in the mill. Back I went, put the head onto my neck and off for home again. But the women and the young ones were laughing at me again. Now what are you laughing at, says I. Isn't your nose at the back of your head, says they. So I gave my head a good twist to set it right and off for home again. Now that's when I remembered that I'd stuck my whip into the ground behind the mill pond. Back I went, but when I got there, what did I see but that a great big tree had shot up from it and my old whip was up at the top. So up and up I climbed, and there at the top, what did I find but a hawk chasing a whole cloud of little birds. 
trying to catch them anyway at all. Straight away the little birds, one and all, flew right up my sleeves, into my shirt and right up my legs, into my breeches. Quick as a flash I tied up my sleeves and breeches and wasn't I happy that I'd caught so many birds? Yes indeed, and all these birds in my shirt and breeches started off chirping and tweeting and all of them giving off in their own language until up they flew with me and carried me off far, far away. I saw the women washing and scrubbing down on the edge of the sea. They looked up and shouted out, Look at that big bird! But I thought I heard them say, Loosen your shirt! So that's what I did, and out flew the birds and down I plopped into the sea. I made such a big splash that I emptied out all the water and the fishes were all left around me. So I gathered up a fine lot of them. I didn't waste any more time there because I was far from home. So I set off back through Hotland. Now Hotland is a strange country indeed, where they don't build their houses on the ground, but up in the air at the height of a man. So they need ladders to get in. The people in Hotland are all big and tall and everything is big. Even the church was so big that there were four soldiers in there on a horseback and when the priest chanted, the Lord be with you, one of the soldiers spurred his horse and off he went and he intoned it to the second, the second soldier to the third, the third to the fourth and he sang it to the respondent. So long was the mass that the congregation could have done with a good breakfast. But that was no problem at all, since the altar was made of ham and the candles were sausages. And just as big and tall was the steeple of the church. When two carpenters were building it, they dropped their hatchets and by the time one of them fell to the earth, it had rotted away. And when the second was in the air, a lark nested in it. And before it reached the ground, it had laid its eggs and raised its chicks. The bell was so large, the only way they could get it into the belfry was to carry it up when it was a baby and let it grow up there. It was hotter than hot there, so hot that all they did was slaughter a pig, put it in a pan and put the pan out of the window and straight away they had roast pork. But I didn't waste too much time there either. I'd had enough and continued on my way home. That's how I got to Coldland. It was so cold there that the white of an egg would freeze so brightly that you could read a newspaper by its light. You couldn't speak there unless you could read. Because when a man said a word, it straight away froze in front of him and the other had to read it. But I didn't waste too much time in Coldland. On I went, on my way home. By the end I was getting so fed up with the journey that I stuck my whip into the earth and climbed up to the heavens. And there was my grandmother. The best of the day to you, Grandma. Do you have some bread and jam for me? Oh dear son, says she, up here we don't really eat. You don't? Then how do I get down from here quickly? Then an old man arrived and I told him as well that I wanted to get back down because there was no bread and jam to be had here at all. The old man remembered that they had a chest of bran and we twisted a rope out of that. I could lower myself down. And as true as I'm here, we plaited it fine enough but a mouse somehow got into it and when I was lowering myself back down, that little mouse bit right through the rope and I plopped down into the ground. I thought I was in the old town somewhere near the church, but I wasn't. I was at the edge of the new town and I was well and truly drilled into the earth, so I shouted out for them to dig me out, but no one came. So I had to go home for a spade and dig myself out. And that's all I remember of my own younger days and how I passed them.
Bulgarian folk tales. The little swine herd. Once upon a time, over oceans deep and mountains high, there lived a poor woman who had a son, and his job was to look after the pigs. No matter what his mother tried to get him to do, it was always the same. There was nothing he could do right or proper, not even if you turned him into an angel. He was good for nothing at all. So anyway, this good-for-nothing of a little swine herd heard that the king would give his daughter's hand to anyone who could hide away so well that she couldn't find him. Now then, swine herd, my lad, he said to himself, roll your sleeves up for there's a lot to win if you go about it the right way. So he gathered everything up, baked himself a satchel of scones, put on his heavy cape and off he went. He walked and he walked through bushes and trees, over hill and dale, and still he couldn't find the castle of the king. For a long week he walked, ate the last of his scones, and still he didn't see a thing. And then he became so thirsty that his tongue hung out like a slipper out of a dog's mouth. Then as he went along, he came upon a well, and on it perched two white doves. Well then, the pair of you, I'll have to eat you both because I'm very hungry indeed. Oh, don't eat us, little swine herd. Draw us some water. We're so thirsty. And one good deed deserves another. And they begged him and begged him not to make a meal of them. So he went and drew up a bucket of water for them, and he himself drank his fill of the cold, sweet water. And so he continued on. But now he was so hungry that his stomach rattled like a dog on a chain. Then he came across a lame fox. Well then, lame fox, I'll have to eat you, I'm so hungry. The lame fox beseeched him not to make a meal of him. One good deed deserves another little swine herd. I'll be able to help you. The swine herd's eyes were popping out of his head with hunger, but he decided not to eat the lame fox. He staggered on and on, and staggered to the right, and staggered to the left, and thought he'd never come to his journey's end. Then, far off, he saw a great lake. Down he went to its shore and saw a little fish struggling at the water's edge. Quick as a flash, he tickled it out of the water. Oh, please don't eat me, little swineherd. I'll repay you for your good deed. The little swineherd looked at the fish, and beautiful it was too, its scales all shiny and gold. He felt sorry for the fish and put it back into the water. On he went and eventually came upon another well, and on it perched two other white doves. Do you think I'm a madman? As sure as the sky above me, I'm going to make a meal of you both. So he tried to catch hold of the doves, but they begged and beseeched him not to do them harm. And the end of it was that he did them no injury, but drew them water, drank a great bellyful himself, and went on his way. Not long after that, he found himself at the castle, and at the gate stood the king. So what brings you to this far off land, said the king. So the little swineherd told his tale and why he had come, that he had heard that the king would give his daughter's hand to someone who could hide away so well that she couldn't find him. And that's what he wanted to try. Fair enough, my lad, said the king, but have you seen the 99 heads up there? Yours will be the hundredth if you can't hide yourself well. The little swineherd looked around and turned to the king and bravely said, I'll do the best I can, your highness. On the following morning, the king came to him and told him to hide himself away before his daughter arose. The little swineherd made himself ready, and what did he see but the two white doves? Come on, we'll take you away. And the two white doves carried him off to hide him behind the sun. The princess prepared herself for the day. She went down to the garden, plucked the finest of the roses and twirled around. Out you come, little swineherd. There you are, behind the sun. And the little swineherd was furious and frightened. 
What could he do? Out he came from the far side of the sun. The next day dawned bright and clear. The little swineherd rose, looked out of the window, and there he saw the lame fox rearing up, waiting to take him away to the end of the world. The princess went down to the garden, plucked the finest of the roses and twirled around. Out you come, little swineherd, come back from the end of the world. And the little swineherd was forced to reappear. On the third day, he went off to meet the little fish at the lake, and the fish took him deep, deep down into the water. Not a living soul comes here. They'll never find me here. But the princess went down to the garden, plucked the finest of the roses, twirled around once, and called the little swineherd from out of the bottom of the lake. That's surely the end of me. My head will be on the hundredth stake, said the little swineherd. He laid himself down to go to sleep, but all he did was toss and turn, writhe and wriggle. On the following day at dawn, he saw two white doves at the window. One of them flew off instantly, but the other one stayed. Come as quick as you can. You'll be turned into a fine rose, and so will I. And that's what happened. By mid-morning, all the buds had blossomed in the garden. Down came the princess, she looked for the finest of the roses and found two of the same beauty. She plucked both of them and fastened them to her dress. Then she twirled around once, but she didn't see the little swineherd. She twirled around twice and still she didn't see him. Father, I can't see the little swineherd. He's hidden himself away so that I can't catch him. He can't have, just twirl around once more. So she twirled around once more for the third time, but she could have twirled around till day was done and still she wouldn't have caught the little swineherd. Then one of the roses on her dress turned into a dove and the other into the little swineherd. My heart's delight, my only love, I will be yours and you will be mine. Nothing in this world will part as ever. And they embraced and kissed and clung together like a bunch of flowers. Soon there was a wedding feast and everyone was invited. And the swineherd king and his beautiful queen lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales The Lad Who Watched Over the Rabbits Once upon a time, very long ago and far away, there lived a king and the king had a daughter, so beautiful that even the painters could not paint her beauty. Now there came a time for her to take a husband and the king said that he would give her in marriage to the man who could catch the apple she threw among them. So they came together, the princes and the dukes, the counts and the gypsy lads to catch the apple. But try as they would, not one of them succeeded. But one day who should turn up but a village lad? Once again the princess flung the apple and the lad caught it as if it had been thrown straight to him. But the king was not overjoyed at this, that a come and go as he pleases lad was to be his son-in-law. Well then, young fellow, I don't know what kind of lad you are to catch the apple, but there's another trial in store for you. I have rabbits aplenty and you have to watch over them. If you can watch them carefully, well and good, but if you can't, then it's off with your head. Now the lad was downcast to hear that he had to watch over the rabbits, for never before had he been a watcher of rabbits. And all of a sudden, an old woman appeared. She said, don't be downcast, young fellow. I shall give you a whistle 
And when you go off to the meadow, all you have to do is blow it and you'll see how useful it will be. Then they let the rabbits out and they ran off in a thousand directions. The lad blew his whistle and the rabbits lined up like soldiers on parade. The king looked out and wondered what kind of lad could keep the rabbits in devilish good order. So the king said to his daughter, Listen, daughter dear, dress yourself up as a poor young woman and take a satchel with you to the meadow and ask the lad for a rabbit, so that in the evening when he brings them home, there'll be one rabbit missing. So the princess dressed herself up in the clothes of a poor young woman, put a satchel under her arm and went out to the meadow. Good day to you, good rabbit herd. God save you. What brings you here, young lady? I'm not a lady. I'm just a poor young girl. I came to see if you could give me a rabbit. Of course I can, he said. If your highness will give me a kiss. I'm not a princess, said she. And she was really fierce in denying it because she didn't want the lad to know who she was. But he knew which way the wind was blowing. Well, just one kiss and I'll give you a rabbit. So the princess thought for a moment to kiss or not to kiss, but in the end, she gave him a kiss. Right away, the lad took hold of a rabbit and put it in the satchel for her. So she set off home. But she hadn't got halfway home when the lad blew the whistle again and the rabbit jumped out of the satchel and scampered back to him. The princess got home and the king said to her, well, did you get a rabbit? She looked in the satchel and, sure enough, there was nothing in it at all. So she said to her father, I tried and I asked, but he didn't give me a rabbit, because she was ashamed to say that she had given him a kiss. So the king said, never mind, I'll try. So the king dressed up as a poor country lad and took a satchel and off he went on a donkey to the meadow where the village lad was to be found. When he got there, he said, God save you, young fellow. How goes it with you? Well enough, said the lad. I have the rabbits to watch over. Have pity on me, young fellow, and give me a rabbit, for I'm as poor as poor can be and sick, and I need the meat of a rabbit to give me strength. Willingly, said the lad. If you kiss the tail of your donkey, so the king thought for a moment and in the end he kissed the tail of the donkey. Well then, the lad gave him a rabbit. The king took the satchel under his arm and sat astride the donkey. But he hadn't got halfway home when the lad blew that whistle of his and the rabbit jumped out of the satchel and left it as empty as the day is long. The king got home, opened the satchel and saw not a rabbit there at all. The princess asked him, Father dear, did you bring a rabbit? Of course I didn't bring one. He wouldn't give me one. Evening came and the king looked out of the window to see how the lad had lined up the rabbits to come home. Like soldiers on parade, in they came and all of them present and correct. Well done, young fellow, said the king. You've done a very good job. You've passed the test. Now there's one more for you, and if you pass that too, then you'll have my daughter as your wife. Now I want you to tell me as many lies as will fit in a sack. So the lad began to think about what lies he could tell. All the king's counsellors sat around in a circle with the lad in the middle, and he started to tell lies. Well, he lied and lied about anything and everything that came into his head. But the king called out, The sack's not full yet. Carry on with your lying. So he carried on. Well, you know, when I was looking after the rabbits, the princess came to me and asked for a rabbit and gave me a kiss in return. Well, didn't the princess grow as red in the face as a rose in bloom? She couldn't get over her shame. 
And after that, said the lad, the king himself came, and I told him to kiss the donkeys. It's full, shouted the king. You don't have to say another word. A big sack full of lies. So the lad didn't say another word. And that's how the king gave his daughter to the lad, who watched over the rabbits. Together they lived happily and peacefully. And when the king died, the lad became king. His kingdom was so blessed that it's a pity he isn't still living today. And that's the end of my story. Hungarian folk tales. Pepper Pot Peter. Once upon a time, there lived a king who lived in doleful sorrow because he had a daughter who limped. His daughter wept and cried day and night because if someone came to court her, they up and left straight away. The king was afraid that his only daughter would spinster her life away, and so he sent the word across his kingdom that whoever could cure his daughter would live in wealth until the day he died. Now so many swarmed to the castle that the doorknob always had a hand on it, but the king's daughter still limped. Pepper Pot Peter also went to try his luck. They called him Pepper Pot Peter because he was really very little. So off went Peter and went and went on his way until he came upon a poor woman who was carrying a heavy load of wood. Let me help you, old lady. I'll carry this, said Peter. And while the old woman was trying to thank him, he had already stacked the wood for her. What brings you to this distant land? asked the old woman just when Peter was bidding her farewell. I'm off to cure the limping daughter of the king. Well, fine it is that you met with me, because only I know what the cure is. But it's not easy to get hold of. Well, tell me which way I have to go. Listen carefully, son. On the summit of the glass mountain, there's a little lamb, and around its neck, there's a golden bell. If you can ring that bell three times under the girl's window, then you are sure to cure her. And how can I find my way there? Only with the magic horse of the King of the Giants. And no one has ever been able to get it out of its stable. Pepper Pot Peter thanked her for her directions and off he went without stopping until he came to the castle of the King of the Giants. Under the gate was a hole and through he went straight to the stables. He tried to untie the magic horse. The horse let out such a whinny that the king of the giants fell out of his chair. For lest I forget, the king was at his dinner. Well then, off he ran straight to the table. Peter in his great fear turned into a flea and hid in the manger. When the king of the giants left, Peter climbed out again to untie the tether of the magic horse. Again the horse let out a whinny, this time so loud that the king hit his head against the wall and off he ran to the stables without pause for thought. Once again he saw not a soul because Peter turned into a flea and hid in the manger. The king gave the horse a good whack. Why should it be whinnying when no one was hurting it? At his third try Peter managed to untie the horse. In vain it whinnied, the king didn't go to the stable. When Peter got through the castle gate with the magic horse, it whinnied so loudly that the walls of the three bastions trembled. The king came out in a rage and saw that his horse had been stolen. He jumped on the back of a tomcat and off he went after Peter. Peter was very pleased with the horse. The moment he set his spurs to it, the horse flew to the glass mountain. 
there he saw the little lamb with a golden bell dancing in the silken meadow. He went up to the lamb, but when he tried to take the bell off the lamb's neck, an angry little devil popped out of the ground. I've been waiting for you, you good-for-nothing, he told Peter, shook him fiercely and ordered him to make a barrel in the woods. When Peter had finished, the little devil went out and sat on the rim of the barrel and said, Now I'm going to stuff you into the barrel, you thief. Peter saw that this was no joke and suddenly turned into a bee and stung the little so hard on the finger that it fell backwards into the barrel. Peter quickly put the lid onto the barrel, leaving a tiny hole so the little devil wouldn't suffocate. He took the bell off the lamb's neck, jumped onto the horse and didn't stop until he got to the window of the limping daughter of the king. He rang the bell for the first time and saw that the bushes and trees started to dance. Then he rang the bell for the second time and the court chamberlain and all the courtiers came out with the king himself and everyone danced and sang. He rang the bell for the third time and then the king's daughter opened the window. Pepper Pot Peter asked her to dance with him and she didn't limp, not even a step. So joyful were they all that no one wanted to stop the revelry. Well, my son, you have cured my daughter. Marry her and make her your wife for life. With that, he took the crown off his head and gave it to Peter, and he was just about to try it on when the King of the Giants arrived on the back of the Tomcat. You can imagine the panic. The King of the Giants opened his mouth wide and swallowed down the whole court in one gulp. He didn't even hiccup. He only spat out the trees and the bricks the way that someone else spits out cherry stones. Peter, at the last moment, had jumped aside and hidden in the trouser pocket of the King of the Giants. There he was safe and sound. The King himself was so full that he could hardly breathe, so he sat down on the ground. Pepper Pot Peter waited until he had fallen asleep, then he climbed out of the pocket, called a thousand spiders together, so that he couldn't move. Then Pepper Pot Peter somersaulted across the belly of the giant and it burst straight away and the people of the court were saved. Nine and ninety tailors sewed up the stomach of the king of the giants. By the time they had finished, the giant had slept it off. But he didn't have such a good time at Peter's wedding feast, for all he could eat was three oxen. A month and a day after the wedding, Peter took possession of the kingdom under the name of Pepper Pot Peter the First. And that's the end of my story. Hungarian Folk Tales The Golden Calf Once upon a time there lived a king and a queen and they had a handsome strong son and a beautiful daughter. One day the king called his children. Dear son, it's time for you to go out find a maiden and get married. I'm getting old and you should take over the burdens and problems of the land from me and you, my daughter, should choose someone whom you would be willing to marry. Father, I do not need anyone. There is not a maiden in this land who was born for me, the daughter continued. I don't want to get married, father dear. There is no prince in this land for me. The king became very angry. Get out of here, both of you. 
I don't want to see you if you are so picky and choosy. So the prince and the princess set out to see the world. As they were walking across the hills, they walked and walked until they became very tired. They rested underneath a tree and they soon fell fast asleep. When the girl awoke, she called her brother. I had a dream, brother. Do you know what I saw? What did you see? Tell me. In my dream, I saw that this tree has magical powers. If you pick a leaf and touch it to the forehead of a sick man, that man will be healed right there and then. And not far from here flows a stream. And even if that man is half dead, he will be cured if he drinks from the water. Let's give it a try. They collected a bunch of leaves and filled their sacks with them. The girl filled her canteen with water and they continued on their journey. They were walking and walking until they reached another land where everyone was dressed in black. Good woman, what's the reason for mourning in this land? My dear son, the prince is so ill that no one can cure him. Our prince said to his sister, let's go and cure him. So they both dressed as doctors and went to see the king. The king was only too pleased to let them in. The princess walked up to the prince and placed some leaves on his forehead. And at that very moment, the prince looked up, their eyes met, and they smiled at each other. The brother of the princess stepped up to the bed and gave the prince a few sips of the healing water. The sick prince sat up in an instant and he was a hundred times healthier than ever before. I'm not going to let you go, whoever you are, you will be my wife. The brother told his sister, well sister, now you've found your true love. It's time for me to walk on until I find mine. And with that, he continued on his journey. And at one point along the way, he heard the sound of drums. The drummers were announcing that the princess would marry the man who found what mark she had under her arm. There were dozens and dozens of candidates who came to try their luck, but none of them had any success. As he was walking around in the town, thinking hard about the riddle, a blacksmith looked out of his window and called to the young man. Where are you going and why? I heard the drums and the announcement and I am supposed to guess what mark the princess has under her arm. Well, that's easy. I have a lot of gold. I could use that to make a golden calf. Somebody could curl up inside that calf and we can take the calf to market. The princess will see the golden calf and will buy it. And the person inside the calf will find out what mark she has under her arm. The prince said, what if that person were me? Well, all right, we can agree on that. In the morning, the prince climbed inside the golden calf and they transported it right to the middle of the marketplace. It wasn't long before the king and the princess came walking by. Father dear, father dear, please buy this one for me. It would look so beautiful in the palace. And she kept on pleading until her father bought the golden calf for his daughter. He told his men to place the golden calf into his daughter's room. Evening came and the princess undressed and went to bed. When the prince was convinced that she was asleep, he opened the little door, climbed out, slowly walked to her bed and peeked under her left arm. And suddenly he saw what was there. The sun, the moon and the stars. He laughed out loud, but he woke the princess up. When she saw the stranger in her room, she let out a scream. But the prince was not afraid and he spoke to the princess. Stop screaming, lest they find out that I'm here with you. The two of them started talking. They agreed that she would have the calf taken back to the blacksmith. And so it happened. In the morning, 
her father came in. Oh, father dear, father dear, I accidentally broke off one of its ears. Let's have it taken back to the blacksmith so he can place it back. They took back the golden calf, the blacksmith opened the side door and the prince climbed out. That afternoon, the prince went to see the king. Your Majesty, please give me three days to think and I'll find out the truth. And he pretended to think long and hard. Finally, the third day came and the princess could hardly wait. The king spoke. So, did you find out? Well, your majesty, she's wearing the sun, the moon and the stars under her arm. Well, by golly, you're right. You've solved the riddle. You can have my daughter and my kingdom. And they had a fabulous wedding with plenty of food and drink for everyone. Of course, they invited the prince's sister and her husband, the other prince, and they did not forget about their parents either. Everyone was happy. The wedding and the party lasted for a whole week and they all lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales Martin and the Cursed Princess Once upon a time, there was a poor man who had three sons. The youngest son's name was Martin. When the boys grew up, their father turned to them and said, Well, boys, you've had enough to eat at home, and now you're old enough and strong enough to work. One year from now, I want you each to return home with a suit of clothes. Off you go, and may God bless you all. The boys did as they were told and they started their journey. After a while, they reached a huge old tree. At this point, the road forked into three directions. The boys said goodbye to each other, and each of them started walking down a different path. As Martin walked along, he reached a forest. A huge, warty frog was approaching him and spoke to Martin. I know you're looking for a job. Come on, work for me, and you won't be sorry. All you have to do is chop and saw some wood. Plus, put me to bed in the evenings and raise me out of bed in the mornings. Well, what do you say? I'm your man. Wherever I have to work, it's all the same. So he shook the frog's hand and stayed. A whole year passed by. The frog was not a bad employer at all. On the last day, it said, well, Martin, you've done a good job. Your brothers are taking their new clothes home. But never mind, just go into the pantry and pick whatever you like. Martin selected a nice suit of clothes and started on his return journey homewards. At the old tree, he met his brothers again. Well, who employed you, Martin? But as soon as Martin told that he was employed by a frog, the boys nearly fell over laughing. But when they saw his new suit of clothes, they all stopped laughing. They grew yellow with envy. After they got home, they stayed home for a while, but when spring came, their father once again spoke to them. Well, boys, it's time for you to be working again. But this time, tell your masters to pay you with wine. The boys did as they were told. When they got to the tree, they said goodbye again, and each went on his way. The frog was already there in the forest. Come and work for me, Martin, 
Your job will be as easy as it was the last time. Martin was already used to the frog and he didn't mind working at all. When the new year was up, the frog told him, Hey Martin, your brothers are already busy carrying their wine home. Never mind anything, go, find a bottle and walk down into the cellar. Fill it up with the wine you like the best. So the year went by and the boys met once again at the crossroads. Both brothers were rolling a sizeable barrel as they went. When they spotted Martin, they couldn't help laughing at him. Well, that frog master of yours is not a generous employer. All he ever gave you was this miserable little bottle. Martin didn't say anything. He rolled out the largest barrel and poured the wine into it. Maybe a smaller barrel will be more appropriate, they mocked at him. But it didn't last for long, because when they saw that the bottle was simply not running out of wine, they were so astonished that their eyes bulged out. Their amazement grew when they tasted it. They rested at home for a while, but then their father sent them off to work again. Now you have clothes and you have wine of your own, and you are ready to get married. But you have to find a wife. The boys did like before, and when they got to the fork in the road, they said goodbye to each other once again. Martin went to see his frog, and the two elder brothers went their own way, whatever it was. The frog told Martin, Well, Martin, this time it's not going to be as easy as before. This time you will have to chop and stack up three times as much wood as last year. When the year was over, the frog told Martin, You've done a good job again, but now you have to be very careful. Gather up my bed linen and take it to the top of that wood stack. Then carry me up and place me on the top of the stack. Martin did as he was told and finally placed the frog on top of the pile of wood. Then he heard the frog call down from the top of the wood. All right, now go, find a broom, then set the wood stack on fire, and as soon as the wood catches fire, you will see frogs leaping towards the fire from all sides. You must sweep all of them up into the fire, but beware, don't let any of them get away, because that would mean great trouble. Martin begged the frog to come down from the top of the pile, but the frog didn't listen. In the end, he had no choice. He had to set fire to the stack of wood. There was a lot of panic and commotion. There were so many frogs, Martin could hardly sweep them all onto the fire. By nightfall, the fire burned down. The frogs were all lost, including Martin's frog master. Martin was very, very sad. He was still full of sorrow when he fell asleep. The next morning, when he opened his eyes, he saw a beautiful maiden standing next to his bed. Martin, thank you for saving me. I had to live as a frog with all my household until an honest lad came along and did everything as I told him. But now you have removed the curse. Martin's heart beat loudly when he saw her. The princess jumped into his arms and said, your brothers are going home with their wives. But don't you worry. Go down to the courtyard and bring the horses to the best carriage. By the time they get home, we'll be there before them. And so it happened. There was great astonishment and a lot of envy. But Martin was a good brother. He gave each of his brothers three sacks full of gold. Then he married the princess and went off to rule as a king. Maybe he could have found himself a better job, but he had no reason to complain, did he now? Hungarian Folk Tales The Cursed Castle 
Once upon a time, long ago and far away, there lived a poor woman who had a daughter. They were both so very poor that they had to live in a crumbling house, and that was all they had. One day the old woman fell ill, and she called to her daughter, My sweet darling daughter, I am sure I shall soon die. I have nothing to leave you, so you should go, find work as a servant, and try to live as best you can. And with that, she closed her eyes and died. She was buried by the people of the village because her daughter had no money to pay for the funeral. All she had was a blanket. So she took her blanket and off she went to see the world. From time to time she tried begging for food or shelter, but nobody ever gave her anything. The people said, you're strong enough to find work, which was true, but the girl was lazy. She found shelter in a garden and stayed there until summer passed. Then, when autumn came, she hid in sheds and barns and stables. One fine day she arrived in a town and it was there that she heard that the king had a castle for sale. The castle would be sold to the person who would not haggle or bargain, but pay the price on the spot. So the girl thought to herself, I will buy that castle. I'll lie and say that I have the asking price. And she did exactly that. She went up to the king, telling him that she would buy the castle. Well, well, said the king, the king has as many windows as there are days in the year, and as many doors as there are days, and rooms as there are months, and that is why the price to pay is 365 florins, no more, no less. If you can pay up without bargaining, the castle will be yours. There will be no bargain, your majesty. I do not have the money with me now, for many debtors owe me this amount. But I promise to pay you back as soon as I get my money, and all you have to do is set a deadline. Very well, young lady. Let us agree on 365 days. Very well, she thought. That is exactly one year from now, and even if they hang me after that, on my dying day, I will be able to tell everyone that I slept in a real royal castle. The king gave her the keys, and the girl walked up to her new room. Once she was there, she inspected all 12 rooms, one by one. Then she locked the door and placed one half of her blanket on the floor and used the second half to cover herself. All of a sudden she heard something that sounded like a meowing cat. Meow, meow. Poor cat, you must be as lonely as me. So she got up and let in the cat. It was a horribly fat black cat. Come over here. Come on, lie next to me and start purring into my ear. Then at least I won't feel lonely. The cat cuddled up next to her and purred so sweetly that the girl fell fast asleep. When she woke around daybreak, she couldn't find the cat anywhere. She reached for the key which was under her head where she put it. The door was locked, the windows were closed. How could the cat have left the room? Well, anyway, if you've left, you've left. You surely know how. When evening came, she laid down once again. The cat returned once more, and so she asked it. Where have you been? How did you get out? But the cat just started meowing, and as it opened its mouth, a magnificent diamond rolled onto the floor. The girl picked it up, turned it around in her hand, not knowing quite what it might be. Finally, she put the stone into a pot and pulled the cat next to her. The cat started purring, and the girl fell asleep. This continued for a month and a day. Just wait, I'm going to find out about that cat, the girl thought. And she did exactly that. When the cat appeared in the evening, she stroked it gently with loving care. The cat put down the gemstone from its mouth and the girl placed it in the pot. The cat started purring to send the girl to sleep, but this time the girl only pretended to slumber. And all of a sudden, when the cat thought that the girl was already fast asleep, the animal sprang up, stamped once with its foot, the door swung open, and in a moment, it was gone. 
The girl did the same. She also sprang to her feet and raced after the cat. The cat ran along a long corridor leading into the castle. There were doors on both sides, but the cat did not enter any of them. When it reached the very last room, it stamped with its foot and entered. The girl followed it in. When she stepped into the room, she saw a door opening in the wall. There were stairs leading downwards. The cat started descending. The girl followed it, and lo and behold, there were magnificent trees on both sides of the stairs. The girl broke two little twigs from each of them, but when the twigs broke, they started jingling, and this caused the cat to turn around. Had she not hidden behind the tree, it would certainly have discovered her. But the cat decided to walk on, and as it went, the girl heard beautiful music coming from down below. When the cat reached a spot, it did a somersault, and when it landed, it had turned into a heartbreakingly handsome young prince. Music was playing, and there were smiling people and great merriment everywhere. The girl observed everything she saw before she finally went back to her room. That evening, the cat returned once again, bringing yet another gemstone in its mouth. It dropped it in front of the girl. The girl pretended not to know a thing about it. You're such a good-for-nothing cat. Where have you been again? You keep escaping from me. But the cat just kept on purring, cajoling the girl. And after a while, the girl said, I know where you've been. I know who you are. I've seen everything. Look at this. This is the proof. The cat let out a scream so loud that all the windows broke. Then it shed its skin, and the girl was looking at a very handsome young prince standing right in front of her. The cat turned prince said, I was cursed to live as a cat until a girl came and discovered where I was going. Now that you have discovered my secret, I will let you have all of these gemstones. Sell them to a jeweler and use the money to pay for the castle. And so it happened. The girl paid the price for the castle. She married the prince. The wedding feast was grand and they both lived happily ever after.